drifting in right thank you very much so we're going to restart that first session was absolutely fantastic what I want to say is <laughs> clearly people here were hearing a lot of things that resonate with them a lot of things that you agree with but it's also okay to disagree and you know what you don't have to hate anyone if you disagree with them this is the marvelous thing <laughs> And that's something we have to fight back on, isn't it? it? We don't have to hate people we disagree with. We can we can be perfectly polite to each other, or at least we can. OK, so we're going to introduce the next session, which I'm sure will be as fabulous as the first session. And it is, of course, chaired by the fabulous Bev Jackson. I just want to remind you that Bev was a founder member of the Gay Liberation Front in the UK. <laughs> In, 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 how old I am. In, <laughs> in 1926. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. The amazing stories that we've heard this morning, very personal stories. And um, this second se session is going to be quite different because we need to look outside these personal stories more at the framework within which these personal stories have come about. Now, we've heard people talk, uh, Helen um, referred to employers, um, and uh, Kate and Baroness Nicholson referred to um, parliamentarians. I think that we have to look in general at um, leadership and a, a profound lack of leadership. And where does that come from? It comes from ignorance, it comes from cowardice, it comes from laziness. People who have not thought very long and deep about these issues will often say, well, that sounds a bit unpleasant. It sounds a bit complicated. Let's leave it to the experts. And as I think most people in this room know, the people who are self-appointed experts are not experts at all. They are activists with a very specific agenda and if you leave it to these people to make decisions, you do not end up with evidence-based policy making and you go down a path which in some cases is extremely dangerous. That is what we're here to discuss today. Now, this session is about language and law and data. And it's, um, what's happened, I think, is been um, a language fog has descended upon us. Well, it hasn't descended upon us from nowhere. It's been created, hasn't it? It's been created by um, gender identity extremists and unfortunately promoted, or at least not um, opposed, by media such as the BBC and other media. And within which this, this language fog is, it goes far further than the, the conflation of sex and gender, which I think everybody knows uh, um, uh, quite a bit about here. It's, people have forgotten the difference between rights and demands, and above all, the difference between beliefs, opinions, and facts. Facts are out of fashion. And um, the other day, I think uh, some of us saw on Twitter that someone was attacked for fact shaming. <laughs> what the hell is that? Are we allowed to have facts? Or have facts simply um, got to stand uh, um, in, in a row alongside other people's lived experience? Um, these are very serious uh, questions. And we're going to be looking then at a more theoretical um, uh, uh, framework within which these things happen. I, I've got a fantastic panel to discuss these um, issues. Um, Professor Robert Wintermoot, um, Professor of Human Rights, um, 
uh, human rights law and um, a signatory of the first Jogjakarta principles. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Lucy Massoud, one, a long-time um, firefighter who these days fights um, different kinds of fires as a barrister, fights for justice. <laughs> Lisa Townsend, um, police and crime commissioner of Surrey, um, one of the most courageous... <laughs> One of the most courageous um, police and, and crime commissioners in the country, which has since gradually, I think, been joined by other police and crime commissioners and who are going to talk about the... Um, we've heard about the capture of the NHS and she will be able to tell us um, about the capture within the police. And then um, Dr. Jane Claire Jones, um, philosopher. <laughs> and... Um, and founder of the Feminist Institute. And then Sally Sullivan, um, Professor Alice Sullivan, who is a sociologist and, of course, um, a data expert. <laughs> and so, Alice, I, I wonder um, if I could start with you, if you could tell us a little bit about what's gone wrong in our data gathering, and bearing in mind that whenever we talk about the problems with sex and gender, which I think have been particularly highlighted in, in, in relation to women's rights, we are also talking about the rights of LGB people because, as J.K. Rowling said, without sex there is no same-sex attraction. And we must always bear this in mind, I think, when we're talking about sex and gender. So, Alice. Shall I take yes, please. Thank you. I won't stand behind the lectern because I think it's too big and you won't be able to see me. <laughs> this is <laughs> it's a problem I always have, I think lecterns are always designed by tall men and not thinking about the tiny professors who might, <laughs> might need to give talks. Um, so we're losing data on sex because public bodies are replacing data on sex with data on gender identity. Now, many of you will be aware that we had a fantastic um, victory on the England and Wales census, thanks to Nick Williams taking them to court. <laughs> but this goes across so many public bodies, so we still have an absolute mountain to climb. And I'll give you a few examples. So there's an organisation called ACAS, which mandates employers to collect data on their gender pay gap. But of course, it collects data now, or tells people to collect data on gender identity, not sex. And it tells employers that they can exclude non-binary people from the data, as though non-binary people didn't have a sex. As though an employer looking at a non-binary female and a non-binary male doesn't know which one might fall pregnant. The NHS now, this was mentioned in the last session, it's particularly important that the NHS is now failing to collect data on biological sex because um, that means that trans people are not being called in for the screening that they need according to their biological sex for things like gynae cancers, for example. So that's disastrous for, for patient care, particularly for trans people, but it's also the data that's then used for research which is muddied. Crime statistics, now they're, they're collect, collected by police, and of course the police are now allowing male perpetrators to self-identify as female, so that those crimes are then reported as female crimes. It makes a huge difference because men are the vast majority of um, those committing crimes like murder and sexual violence. So, you know, crime is one of the areas where it makes a massive difference. It affects universities as well, and this is something I'm particularly worried about at the moment. So the Athena Swan Charter was set up in order to monitor women's careers going into STEM subjects, so that's science, technology, engineering, and maths. But they have now mandated that universities should collect data according to gender identity, not sex. And it's really insidious because, similar to Stonewall, Athena Swan give out gold stars to universities. And if you don't have a bronze 
Athena Swan Award, you can't get research council funding. Now, it's sometimes argued, um, well, no, you know, who cares about this? It's not such a big deal because it's just a handful of people. There's just a few of them, and why can't we just be kind, essentially? Um, in fact, it's a bogus argument for more than one reason. So one reason is that actually we don't have good, accurate data on the number of trans, non-binary, etc., people in the general population. And this is a picture which is, is, of course, changing really rapidly. So 10 years ago, it might have been true to say, well, this is a very tiny group. Um, but now, although the figures do vary internationally, but for example, one study that I saw recently by the American College Health Association showed that by 2021, the number of female undergraduates identifying as transgender had reached one in 20. <laughs> that is not negligible. And that's, that has shot up from, of course, a very low base. So it makes a big difference. And one instance where recording data on gender identity instead of sex makes a huge difference is when we're looking at data on sexuality, so on lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. So you all know this, when, uh, when an opposite sex attracted person identifies as the opposite sex, they then start to identify as being same sex attracted. So a straight man who starts identifying as a woman will probably identify as a lesbian. And conversely, a lesbian girl who starts to identify as a boy becomes straight for the purposes of the data. So you gain male lesbians into the lesbian category and lose female lesbians. And that fundamentally alters the nature of that category. And of course, the same, the same logic applies for gay men. And this makes a huge difference in data terms, actually, because heterosexuals are by far the dominant group. So I'll give you an example. There's a study called Understanding Society, um, which is a massive UK household panel study, representative data. Now, in 2012, they did um, a wave of data collection with over 40,000 people responded. 94% of respondents said they were heterosexual, 1% ticked gay or lesbian, 1% bisexual. So what that means is you've got 482 people saying they're gay or lesbian. And of those, 183 were recorded as female. So 183 female lesbians. <laughs> and given the small size of this, it only takes 1% of males out of that 40,000 plus data set to identify as lesbians, and you've got more male lesbians than female lesbians. <laughs> and of course, at the same time, you'll have um, the, the flip side of that, which is young girls identifying out of being lesbian into the heterosexual <coughs> category. So the removal of sex as a category erases lesbians and gay men as meaningful categories for data analysis. It's really shocking because it's not so long that we've even been collecting data on sexuality in major surveys. So I was um, in charge of a major survey um, called the 1970 Birth Cohort Study between 2010 and 2020. My first wave of data collection was in 2012 when those cohort members born in 1970 were 42 years old. That was the first time that they were asked about their sexuality. So it's a very small window between 2012 and now that we have had accurate data on sexuality. Um, we, we need to defend this, we need to fight back. Thank you very much, Alice. I, I was struck by your referring to the victory um, of getting the um, ONS to, to um, ask the proper question about sex, but isn't it shocking that um, grassroots uh, women's organizations had to raise £100,000 to effectively get the law applied? It is absolutely shocking, and there was a, a long, long process before we went to court where um, quantitative social science 
practice made their views absolutely clear. So, I mean, I've been quite fortunate in this, I think, because there are other women academics who've been really vilified even among their peers. I had the support of my peers. They stood up to be counted and they said, we need data on sex. It's a fundamental demographic category. They were shocked when I told them that this was happening. They stood up, they said what they thought, and ONS ignored them. Now, that is extraordinary. This is something that should never have ended up in court. Thank you, and I hope that we'll come back to how we're going to change this, because uh, um, I, I would imagine you agree with me that we're dealing with a failure of leadership here um, that, that has to be addressed. Um, we're going to move now to um, a, a, an even wider framework of international law. And um, Professor Rob Wintermoot is going to discuss um, the a, a chronological movement. He's going to uh, focus largely on the European Court of Human Rights, um, the case law of which is still, of course, extremely important for UK law. And he's also going to discuss the Jockey Carter Principles. Now, the Jockey Carter Principles, known to many of you, is a set of principles which was essentially, I think it's fair to say, devised by a, a, an international group of activists. But it has taken on a life of its own, it has no legal standing, but it is um, of, uh, quoted again and again, and uh, it's extremely influential. And um, it's often referred to, the Jockey Carter Principles, both the earlier one and the later one, which is, was about 10 years later, 2017, I believe, um, referred to as best practice. It is anything but best practice. And um, Professor uh, Wintermoot is going to lead us through what he calls four um, transgender demands. Remember, I've mentioned before the difference between demands and rights and the fourth and most extreme of those being to just stop recording sex altogether so rob hello can you hear me uh, i haven't been behind a lectern for a long time so i'm going to enjoy this moment uh, <laughs> It takes me back to October 2000 when I gave the Stonewall Lecture at the Law Society, and my title was Lesbian and Gay Equality 2000, back in the days before alphabet soup. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the political tensions surrounding transgender rights today are the result of what I would call abuse of sympathy which has led to an escalation of demands over the last 20, 20 years. The four transgender demands I will discuss have increasingly failed to take into account the rights and freedoms of others, a phrase used in the European Convention on Human Rights. The rights and freedoms that have been ignored are those of lesbian, bisexual, and heterosexual women who also have human rights. The first transgender demand was that the United Kingdom allow a change of legal sex after genital surgery. In 2002, in the case of Christine Goodwin versus UK, the European Court of Human Rights, or Strasbourg Court, ruled that the UK must allow a post-operative transsexual to change their legal sex, because around 90% of Council of Europe member states already did so, and because the applicant, at great personal cost, had done everything she could, to, could do to make her body appear as female as possible. However, in 2002 and today, it was and remains likely that the majority of transgender persons do not wish to have genital surgery. This gave rise to the second transgender demand, change of legal sex without surgery or hormones, but with safeguards. A diagnosis, a diagnosis and a waiting period of two years. The UK government agreed to this demand, which was incorporated into the Gender Recognition Act 2004, or GRA, even though it went well beyond what the Strasbourg Court had required and had no precedent at the national level anywhere in the world. Acceptance of the second transgender demand means that today, a person born male can obtain a gender recognition certificate and become legally female, even though they have a beard, a deep voice, and male genitals. The law allows them to become legally female, even though almost no one seeing or hear, hearing them would consider them female. 
In 2007, when only the UK had a law of this kind, the second transgender demand became principle three of the Jogjakarta principles, a civil society document which purports to state the minimum requirements of international human rights law and is often cited in the UK, as Bev said, as representing international best practice. In 2012, Argentina became the first country to accept at the national level the third transgender demand. Change of legal sex without safeguards based solely on self-identification with no diagnosis or waiting period. Since 2014 in Europe, the Argentine, Argentine model has been adopted by at least seven countries. Denmark, Iceland, Ireland, Luxembourg, Malta, Norway, and Switzerland, and is currently being considered by Spain. In April 2017, in the case of AP Garçon and Nico versus France, the Strasbourg Court declined to make the third transgender demand, self-identification, a minimum European standard, because so few countries had adopted the Argentine model. The court did, however, make the second transgender demand, no surgery, a minimum European standard, even though it was the law in only 18 of 47 Council of Europe member states, including the UK. The no surgery aspect of the GRA, which was optional in 2004, is thus now required by the case law of the Strasbourg Court. In November 2017, the second version of the George Carter Principles incorporated the fourth transgender demand. Principle 31 claims that, under existing international human rights law, every country in the world has an obligation to end the registration of the sex of the person in identity documents such as birth certificates. Until this is done, the third transgender demand, self-identification, must be adopted. No eligibility criteria such as a psychomedical diagnosis or minimum age shall be a prerequisite to change one's legal sex. With regard to change of legal sex, the Jogjakarta principles are not a neutral statement of international human rights law, but rather a radical advocacy document. I would argue that the GRA is very generous and that the UK Parliament should not amend it for England and Wales or the Scottish Parliament for Scotland especially because the Strasbourg Court does not require us to amend it. Proponents of change consider the requirement of a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to be humiliating or stigmatizing. But we must remember that a transgender person seeking a change of legal sex is asking for an exemption from the general rule that a person's birth sex is their legal sex for life because their birth sex never changes. Exemptions have conditions. We can justifiably attach conditions to crossing the legal border from male to female or female to male, just as we attach conditions to crossing an international border, acquiring a new citizenship, being granted refugee status, being approved as an adoptive parent, obtaining disability benefits, or being granted the status of conscientious objector to military service. In none of these situations is it sufficient to self-identify as a visitor, citizen, refugee, adoptive parent, disabled person, or conscientious objector, objector without an assessment process. <clears throat> I would like to add here that my partner, whom I met through LGB Alliance, so for all you single people out there, <laughs> you're, in, <laughs> you're, in, you're in the right place. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he is going to be applying for British citizenship in January. Guess how much the fee is? 1,330 pounds, okay? How much is the recently announced fee to uh, become legally female if you were born male? Five pounds, okay? I think there's a statement of value there in, in that, that very fee. Although self-identification has so far been rejected for England and Wales, we must remember that it could become an issue in the Strasbourg Court in a future case that could affect the UK. It will be important for 
sex is real or gender critical groups to make their voices heard in the court, which already has five pending cases on persons born male claiming legal recognition as mothers and persons born female claiming legal recognition as fathers. The four transgender demands I have discussed are not about equal rights. They are about weakening or abolishing altogether a system that has served us well. To protect women, it records birth sex and attaches legal significance to birth sex in certain circumstances. We need only compare the four transgender demands with LGB demands in the past. LGB people did not seek to liberate heterosexual women from marriage by abolishing marriage. We sought and have ended up with the same choices as opposite sex couples, to marry, form a civil partnership, or live together without registering. The transgender rights movement has gone well beyond seeking equal rights. It seeks to liberate women without their consent from the legal protections associated with birth sex and even from the recording of birth sex. Better protection of the human rights of a very small minority must not come at the expense of the human rights of the majority of the population. <clears throat> In closing, I would like to say that I've changed my mind with regard to certain transgender demands, including access to women-only spaces, after listening to women. Men are rarely, if ever, affected by transgender demands, so it is easy to say yes. We must always try to imagine ourselves in the changing rooms, hospital wards, and prisons of lesbian, bisexual, and heterosexual women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It's, I, I think it deserves some, a special applause, applause for someone who has changed his mind, who was so important. <laughs> and, <laughs> to realize that, that other people's rights matter too. Um, perhaps you could just say a brief word, Rob, about why these um, cases uh, that come up in the European Court of Human Rights are important to LGB people and not only to women, but um, why this is a, a real issue for, why it's an LGB issue. Um, that's the awkward question. I was hoping you wouldn't, wouldn't ask me. <laughs> well, we're here at uh, LGB Alliance. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, well, I'll give you the same answer I gave before. Uh, women's rights or lesbian rights. So that's enough of an LGB connection for me. Um, I think we've discussed this before, but the, the particular issues that arise on lesbian dating si sites within the, the phenomenon of what we heard of the male lesbians, um, it's, for me, it's not uh, really a legal issue. It's more of a social one, so that's why I tend not to get uh, involved in it. But if I could just say two things now, I have, have the, the, the mic. Um, one is um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has been a great friend of the LGB community. And in fact, tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of the historic judgment in the case of Jeffrey Dudgeon versus United Kingdom concerning the law criminalizing sexual activity between men in Northern Ireland. Um, so actually, the UK was behind the trend in Europe on LGB issues and only caught up because of pressure from the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so the fact that we might disagree with the trend on transgender case law doesn't mean the European Court of Human Rights is not our friend. And the second point is also the Jogjakarta principles. There's a, a tendency to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, remember, the L Georgia Carter principles have lots of LGB content that is really good. And most of the transgender content is good, and we would agree with. So that's why I always give you the numbers, principles 3 and 31. So it's the principles about change of legal sex where the, the Georgia Carter principles go astray. Thanks, Rob.
I suppose uh, my own answer is, is, is that whenever sex uh, is, is conflated with gender identity, this weakens the rights of, of, of people with same-sex sexual orientation as well as women's rights. But we, we often get into this discussion, so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd make life awkward for you again anyway. <laughs> um, Lucy is going to uh, uh, talk to us uh, now about the way in which um, the, um, the UK justice system has been affected by the um, strange language confusion that I uh, spoke about and the imposition of um, odd ideologies. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lucy Massoud and I'm a family barrister that has been practicing for three years. Before coming to the bar, I was a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade for 12 years. Whilst a firefighter, I was elected to a senior role within my union, the Fire Brigade's union, and as well as taking up a senior position in the union, sitting on the regional executive, I was also the LGBT rep for London members. Now, I've spoken publicly before about the issues that I experienced as a female firefighter within the London Fire Brigade, and the attacks that I received from other union officials when I challenged my union on their intended acceptance of self-ID. So when I left the London Fire Brigade for a life at the bar, I was very optimistic that I would now be working within an environment that dealt with facts and evidence. <laughs> and I felt sure that my fellow legal professionals would be the last to fall to the extreme trans ideology. Unfortunately, my confidence was short-lived and actually, what I found was not only the judiciary and the CPS finding themselves in exactly the same difficulties as the Fire Brigade Union had when it came to the issue of female sex-based rights, but actually the influence upon our judicial structures by trans rights groups appeared to be having direct implications on not only our judges, people's conduct in court, but also even case law. Take, for example, the little-known case of Maya Forstatter. <laughs> In Forstatter, Judge Taylor found that Maya's belief that biological sex is objective and cannot be changed was, quote, incompatible with human dignity and therefore not protected by discrimination law. When making his judgment, Taylor referenced something called the bench book. He actually quoted from it. The bench book is a document issued by the Judicial College, who are the body responsible for training judges. And it is intended to be a practical guidance aimed at helping make the court experience more accessible for parties and witnesses. And there's a chapter in the bench book that deals with parties and witnesses who are transgender. However, in Forstatter, when giving judgment, Judge Taylor seemed to use the bench book less of a guide in helping trans people take part in the proceedings, but instead he used it as a guide to what transgenderism meant in general. Of serious concern is that the bench book puts forward a concept of trans identity which is based on self-identification and is different from anything recognised in English law. So what we had was a judge using the bench book as a practitioner's text instead of using it as a simple guidance on how witnesses should be dealt with in court. And reading the bench book, <clears throat> it's easy to see why Judge Taylor was so convinced that Forstatter's belief was incompatible with human dignity. After all, Maya held an opinion about what it meant to be a female that differed totally from what was in the bench book. So what are the dangers that this could lead to? Well, we know that when Maria McLaughlin appeared in court after being assaulted by a trans woman, she was criticized by the judge for refusing to refer to her male attacker as she. We also have examples of female victims of sexual assault having to refer to their male rapist in court as she. Now, you may think that if the judiciary has been captured by trans ideology, 
then what hope do other organisations have? And it's a fair concern. When our judiciary accepts the notion of self-ID by the back door, then it's easy to see why self-ID has been accepted by so many organisations, despite it not actually being part of our law. After all, if we can't count on a court of law to preserve the legal definitions of what sex is, then it's easy to see how our language and laws can be misused generally, not just for sex-based rights, but also for LGB rights. For example, the policy statement by the UCU supports the rights of a white male to self-ID as a black female. The UCU, by the way, which is the union that represents academics and <laughs> lecturers. Yet, in their policy statement, they so callously sacrifice the rights of women and people of colour in favour of the rights of white men. So when we are told that black lives matter, perhaps black lives will matter now that white people can be black. <laughs> These hypocrisies must be challenged, because if we don't challenge them, then concepts such as self-ID, such as men can be lesbians, white people can be black, will suddenly become part of our reality, and even eventually part of our belief of what the law is, or indeed the law as Stonewall would like it to be. As an openly gay woman since the age of 16, I have watched in horror as in the last few years, not only our language of what it means to be a lesbian is corrupted, but also our ability as lesbian and gay men to choose our own partners is also attacked. This attack on same-sex attraction is nothing more than trans uh, homophobia. <laughs> uh, I've been captured. Such homophobia that most of us have dealt with our whole lives and is now homophobia dressed up as progressive and inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Lesbian and gay men are being subjected to abuse and accusations of bigotry simply for stating that we are same-sex attracted. Much of these attacks come from the extreme trans activists but also so-called left-wing commentators. They are outside now, protesting our very rights to be here today. These same individuals attack us online, they try and cancel us, they contact our workplaces, they try and get us sacked, they use targeted harassment against us, and they target us simply because we disagree with the mantra that trans women are women. <clears throat> Only last week, <clears throat> when I came out publicly in support of Kathleen Stock, within half an hour of doing so, I received a barrage of online abuse. I was called a turf, a bitch, a Tory, and a cunt. Well, I'm many things, but I'm not a Tory. <laughs> And of course, these same activists and commentators tell us that sex doesn't matter. They demand that we accept that trans women are women and trans men are men without question. We are told that same-sex attraction is transphobic and that men can be lesbians. Well, I've said this before, so I'll say it again. For the avoidance of doubt, I am a proud lesbian. I am same-sex attracted. I do not date people with penises and I will not be bullied back into the closet by those trans activists outside. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just a brief reminder, we are strictly non-party political in LGB Alliance. <laughs> And um, uh, we, we have um, 
uh, our supporters come from all mainstream political parties. Um, <laughs> but that was, um, was a very rousing um, speech, and it's particularly shocking to see that, um, that judges are being told to take instructions from a book which is actually at odds with the law. And again, we ask the question, where is the leadership here? What has gone wrong? I, I, for me, this is the essential question at the moment. Well, anyway, um, we've heard about the capture of the NHS. And um, Lisa Townsend um, is one of the bravest people in the country, I think. <laughs> because it is not easy at this moment to talk about the capture of the police about the need for the police to spend quite a lot of money um, uh, uh, creating um, rainbow-colored cars and all the rest of it, and putting up um, flags. And, um, well, Lisa's going to tell us something about it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Lisa, and I'm a Tory. <laughs> <laughs> so, the last time I was on a panel uh, was a couple of weeks ago at Conservative Party Conference in Manchester. And can I just say how lovely it is to finally be in a room with a bunch of Christian right-wing bigots? <laughs> <laughs> well, much more attractive. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the Conservative Police and Crime Commissioner uh, for Surrey. I, I am a Tory. I am a politician. Um, and you will have MPs talking to you later. I can see Joanna down there. I know that Jackie Doyle-Price and, and Rosie will be here later. So they'll talk about parliamentarians. Um, but it's an interesting time to be a politician at the moment. Um, and a Tory, and a woman, and standing up for, for these things. So, first of all, most of you won't ever have heard of police and crime commissioners. So, um, they've been around for about nine years. I've been a police and crime commissioner for all of about five and a half months. Um, it was never an ambition. Um, I always thought that I, one day I might be an MP, um, and then the opportunity came up and I took it. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly, very, very briefly, what it is that we do, because most of you won't have a clue. Um, so we are elected by um, those residents, those on the electoral roll, in our force area. So for me, that's Surrey. Um, there are 43 police forces around England and Wales. Um, not all of them have a police and crime commissioner, London being the obvious one, where, of course, Sadiq Khan is um, sort of... He's nominally the police and crime commissioner. Um, but most forces around England and Wales have a police and crime commissioner. Our statutory duty is to hold the chief constable to account. We are answerable to, and only to, our electorate. So in my case, that's Surrey. I have a 42,000 majority in Surrey. Um, I have every intention of standing again. There are people, I believe, standing outside uh, who have every intention of stopping that happening. Um, and so, so, so that's, what we do, that's what we do, that's the job. We are also, in theory, technically held to account by our police and crime panel, which is made up by, in my case, Surrey County Council uh, councillors. They are currently investigating me. I found out for, for, I think, about 40 complaints. There'll be more after today, if I, if I get this right. Um, LAUGHTER Uh, so they're investigating me for complaints that have come, not just from Surrey residents, I should say, but from, from anybody who wants to complain about anything that I have said. Um, and I found out last night that they won't allow me to appear in person to defend myself. They will instead have an hour and a half and debate amongst themselves why I'm an awful, turfy bigot. Um, but, you know, there we go. Um... So, yeah, so I have a statutory duty to hold the police constable to account. And I, I didn't become a police and crime commissioner because um, this was a particular issue for me that I thought I need to become a police and crime commissioner so I can fight stonewalling in the police. And I am uh, I'm a, I'm a white, heterosexual, married woman from Surrey <laughs> <laughs> with no children. So why on earth am I sitting up here and watching you fabulous people what I mean and I do I do question what right do I have 
to, to stand here, to sit here and talk to you all. And I've had the most, I mean, I've, I came in this morning and I have to say, completely starstruck. I'm like, oh my God, it's Maya Forster. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, oh, it's Helen Joyce. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm ridiculously starstruck and you're all, you're all absolutely amazing. It's fabulous. Um, but I, it was, I think, and I think a lot of us, it's probably true of, of a lot of us, particularly a lot of women, where this was just something I sort of thought, well, it's bloody obvious, isn't it? And, um, and then, and I'd, I'd sort of said it to friends, and I'd said it to gay friends, and they'd said, well, you're wrong. Um, and I thought, oh, okay. And I think it's really interesting, um, and Bev is absolutely right, I think we're all right to, to recognise when people change their minds, because it, it, it's important. And it was important to me to look back and question, am I right about this? I, this is what I think I know, but am I actually right? And I went back, and I, and I thought it through, and I spoke to people who had different views from me, and I still kept coming back to the conclusion that, no, no, I think I, think I am right about this. But I didn't speak up because I was in employment, and I thought, well, what does my voice as a white heterosexual woman from Surrey matter in this debate? And then I was selected as the Police and Crime Commissioner candidate for Surrey, and I suddenly started having all of these women, many of whom are in the room, writing to me to say, we really care about this issue. And I thought, oh my God, it's not just me. People care enough about this to write to me about it as a political candidate. And the more women I heard from and the more women I spoke to, and I thought, gosh, no, there really is, there is a movement here. And the more I read and the more I learned, the more horrified I became. And I suspect, like, pretty much every person in this room, I was a huge supporter and advocate of Stonewall. I spent 10 years working uh, in the House of Commons, in Parliament, for Conservative MPs. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and during the equal marriage debate, the MP I worked for he was voting against. He did ultimately vote against equal marriage. And I found that really, really difficult because I just vehemently disagreed with him. And I found Stonewall to be a really, really useful ally for me um, in trying to, I suppose, put my arguments in a cohesive way forward as somebody who is, who is not gay um, as to why I disagreed with this. Um, and so I found them enormously helpful. So to find myself in a position where I, I'm sort of on the other side of the argument from Stonewall, it was really, really uncomfortable at first, but it was clear that there was a problem here, and there was a clear that there was a problem in policing. And Alice has spoken very, very eloquently about the issues around um, data collection in crime, and it is important because we know that the biggest single um, factor in whether or not you will commit a serious, violent sexual crime is your biology, is whether you are male or female. Not whether you identify as male or female, but whether you are male or female. <laughs> so, just, it's, it's, yeah, it's so bloody important and obvious to all of us. Um, <laughs> so, so, this seemed to me sort of a really obvious thing, and, and the more I got into it, I thought, no, this is really important, and I looked at what Stonewall were doing, and I looked at the diversity uh, champion scheme and the index and all of that, um, and on day one in my job, um, so first day, I've just been elected, walk into, walk into Surrey Police HQ, sit down in the morning, first meeting with the chief constable, who's, you know, my job to hold him to account. And he's been in policing for, you know, nearly 30 years. I've never been a police officer, not done anything. I've walk, basically walked in off the street. And one of my first questions for him is, so talk to me about the force's relationship with Stonewall. And you can imagine how popular that made me. Um, and I, I kept asking about it. And I'll get in trouble for this, but I didn't get an answer that, that satisfied me in the way that made me think, yep, yeah, all, is, all is okay here. And so when the fabulous Joe Bartosz, um, who I know is speaking to you all later, um, when the fabulous Joe Bartosz got in touch and said, can I talk to you about this and potentially do an interview? I was like, absolutely. Um, and, and we did it, and then I got in a load of trouble, and you know, here we are today. Um, but, but all I did was said what I thought. <laughs> And this, this is the thing that I find really interesting about this. It's, it shouldn't be brave to say what you think. And I feel very, very strongly that if somebody who is in a position like I am, where I'm elected, the only people who can kick me out, sorry, Pride and Surrey, but the only people who can kick me out of my, of my job are the Surrey electorate. And that's right, because that's democracy. <laughs> And 
And if in three years' time the Surrey electorate look at me and the 42,000 majority I have sort of suddenly goes, no, she's a bigoted, turf, racist. Oh, I've been called all of those things as well by the force because, you know, obviously they all follow. And I don't know if I mentioned I'm a Tory. And um, so, and if they decide, you know, we don't, we don't want this woman there anymore, then that's absolutely fine. But the number of people who said to me, oh, I'm not sure you want to speak up about this. In fact, everybody I know said, don't speak up about this for a whole load of reasons. First of all, you'll get death threats. Well, yes. Um, you'll get called a witch and a bitch and a turf and, you know, uh, and a Tory. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, and all of that. And then there were other people who said, um, who were sort of being, they were trying to give good sound career advice. And I get it, you know. And they were trying to give really good, sensible career advice. And like, this don't, you don't want this to be the issue that defines you. Well, I think anybody who is in a privileged and fortunate enough position to be able to, to go into politics and then to be able to campaign and win a seat, um, you know, to be able to be defined by anything is quite lovely. And if this is the issue, then hell yeah, because if this is the issue... <laughs> I will happily go to my grave being defined by, by standing up for women, by standing up for the lesbian... Um, gay, bisexual community, I mean, you know, any day, all day long. Um, and sort of, I think the particular issue for me, or certainly where it started for me, was with Stonewall and was with what I think has been an overcorrection in the police. Policing for, for a very, very, very long time treated this community so appallingly, so badly. Um, it, it, I mean, it's just absolutely shameful. There is a shameful history here within policing. And, yeah, that's it. And, and, and you must never forget, and I'm sure you will never forget, and you must hold on to that. And, and what's happened is policing has changed enormously. I mean, in, in all kinds of ways, it has changed. It's changed for women. It's changed for uh, gay and lesbian people. It's changed. It's, it's just, it's changed um, from a race point of view, and that's all good. But I do think, and Alice has spoken about this as well, this sort of niceness has led to an overcorrection. And the problem is, and it was really, really interesting, I spoke to, to Kate earlier after she spoke about the NHS. We're seeing exactly the same thing in the police. A lot of what Kate said about the NHS, I absolutely see reflected in the police. And it is a new kind of homophobia, I think, that is taking root. <laughs> and what's, what for me that was really sad was I, after the article came out uh, in the Mail on Sunday, and there was a lot of criticism, I should say, from the police force about the fact that it was in the Mail on Sunday, that sort of evil Tory paper. And um, the truth, there were a number of reasons why it was in the Mail on Sunday. One, one was because that was who sort of Joe was able to talk to and get the article in, which is brilliant. But the other great thing about the Mail on Sunday is it's not behind a paywall, so anybody could read it. Um, and it has a fantastic female membership, uh, readership, particularly in Surrey, which was important for me, because if I'm going to say something like that, <laughs> I want it to be read, right? <laughs> what's, what's the point? Um, but so that came out. And then it was the emails that I received, first of all, from women all over the world. I had flowers sent. I got chocolates. I was sent all these beautiful cards. Some of you who sent them are in the audience. Thank you so much. Um, they're all over my office now. My chief constable can't walk into my office without seeing them all. Uh, it's great. Um, and Pride and Surrey came into my office a few weeks ago. All the cards. <laughs> Keep sending them. Um, and uh, although Pride and Surrey have said that they don't want to come back to my office because they feel physically threatened by me. Um, but I had emails from, um, from, from members of the police saying that they didn't feel they could speak up. And I think this is really important because the police are not, they don't just look after us, they are also an employer. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm really, really concerned about the homophobia that's being, this new homophobia in policing. Um, and I will keep working with you to do everything I can to stop it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Jane, where, where are we going to start? With, with, uh, with, with, can I have the microphone? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's another one. 
Um, Are we going to start with leadership, with language, with cowardice, with ignorance? Where would you like to start? <laughs> sum it all up now, quickly. <laughs> um, the first thing I wanted to sum up was, we'll, we'll talk about leadership, um, which is part of this story. Um, I think it's a very important part of the story because I think this came out very clearly in the Nolan documentary as well. And um, Lisa McKenzie, who is not here, but who wrote The Political Erasure of Sex with me from Murray Blackburn McKenzie, we would have this conversation a lot. Lobby groups are supposed to lobby. Yeah, it's to some, we can have our critiques of trans ideology and I'm gonna go on to talking about that. But um, in a certain sense, Stonewall is just doing what a lobby group does, which is lobby. It's the job of institutions not to allow their policy to be completely captured by lobby groups. Um, <laughs> and you know, there are many things that are extremely frightening about the current situation, not least of which is I no longer have to worry how, wonder about how totalitarianism happens, which is a thing I used to be very concerned with when I was younger. I, I did a lot of my political work, um, my. English essays when I was 16 on like 1984 and apartheid and I was like how does this happen and now I'm like oh okay I now I, I think I get it not necessarily something I needed to <laughs> but you know um but that's that's a very important thing to think about is is what this shows about our institutions and the uh, nature of our democratic processes and their transparency and these things sound a bit boring you know transparency and accountability and these but I think the situation like this really brings it into sharp relief why they are so important because otherwise you end up in a situation like this where an ideology can completely capture civic society in a way that has massive material effects on different constituencies of people and it's because the processes in our institutions have failed. And that is a real problem. That's a real problem. Um, you know, due democratic process doesn't sound sexy, turns out really important. <laughs> okay, so the thing that I wanted to uh, bring together is, is some of the threads about, um, that, were, that were discussed. Um, and the, the concept that I've been using, which was also the, the title that we used for the census report, is I've been calling this the, the political erasure of sex. Um, I think it comes through extremely clearly in all of the examples, um, particularly, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to work on this. I, unlike Alice, I'm not a data person, as people know. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, but I did the work on the census report because it was such a pure example of this process of political erasure. Because there's, there's, you know, you can understand like validation and access to spaces and pronouns and these types of things, but, but to actually be really focused on changing the sex question and replacing it and redefining it as a gender identity question somehow kind of demonstrates the core structure of the ideology that we're dealing with, which is this, effort to just remove the recognition of sex in language, in law, in public policy, in data collection, in the organization of space, and to overwrite the entire thing with gender identity. And it's happening at all of these multiple different levels. And obviously, it has effects on the collection of data, it has effects on the organization of public space, it has effects on the recognition of family relationships, how we record genealogy, and also, clearly, on how we define people's sexuality, because strangely, people's sexuality has got something to do with sex. <laughs> um, I, I, I worry about these kids. I worry about these kids. I worry about them when I realize that they seem to think that sex has got nothing to do with bodies or I was, sometimes I have, I mean, the whole genital fetish thing is so bizarre. Fetishism is taking your libido and putting it into a non-sexual thing. Directing your libido at other people's genitals is by definition not fetishism. <laughs> And 
And also they're like, what has it got to do with genitals? I'm like, you rub them together. <laughs> I don't know what you're not understanding here. <laughs> I wasn't, this is not in my notes. <laughs> so, you rub them together, guys. Come on, what do you do? I mean, this is like, they've got no music. It's like, you've got no music and you're not fucking, are you? <laughs> okay. Bev was like, are you going to swear? And I'm like, I'll try not to, but probably. So. Um, so there's this, so... We have this issue about the political rage of sex, and obviously it has an issue, it has an impact on women, and, and we understand that, but actually the issues that it has on LGB people are actually quite similar in their broad terms, in terms of what is actually happening is the political erasure of the recognition of certain classes of people. And by definition, then also the recognition that they have specific legitimate political interests, which can be distinguished from other groups of people. And there's a, I mean, I think the point um, about the overcorrection is correct. The forced teaming that is being going on, that this was planned. The forced teaming was conceptualized at the beginning of the trans rights movement. <coughs> they understood that they needed to attach themselves to the LGB. So there are, uh, there, there's a couple of like, historical things that I wanted to say about that. In 1993, there was the third march in Washington that was organized, which was a gay rights and, uh, march, and the transgender community were not part of that march. In 1993, so there was an organization called the International Conference for Transgender Law and Employment Policy. And it sounds very dry, but they met in a Hilton hotel in Houston, Texas, because don't all marginalized communities meet for a week in Hilton hotels in Houston, Texas, at the inception of their rights movement? Anyway, they met in a Hilton hotel in Houston, Texas from 1993 to 1996, and they laid the legal and conceptual foundations of the trans rights movement in this Hilton hotel. And one of the things that was laid down there was the conceptualization of the forced teaming with the LGB community. In 1993, they uh, went to the march on Washington, a small delegation from the ICTLEP, and they gave a speech basically kind of denigrating and demanding that the T be added to the LGB. And in the course of that speech, this is the earliest reference I can find to Soji. They basically, so, one of the claims, um, Phyllis Fry, who is a late transitioning male lawyer who didn't want to have surgery and was one of the people who was really instrumental in shifting the concept from transsexualism to transgenderism, was the person who gave the speech in the 1993 March on Washington. And the demand that was made there was that we must seek legal protection from discrimination on the basis of both sexual orientation and gender identification. And that's the earliest reference, one of the earliest references I can find to the, to the SOGI formulation, to the F, which has now become, as, as well, no, has now become international law common parlance for the way that LGBT is discussed. I, I have not found any other earlier references to that particular way of formulating it. So I'm not an international lawyer, so I'd be interested. I've asked some of my friends when they first started hearing that formulation. Um, I think it was a lot later than 1992, 1993. And also in that speech that Phyllis Fry gave, that's also where a lot of these kind of made up canards about rewriting gay rights history came from, notably the claim that the majority of the gay people that were killed during the Holocaust were actually trans. That claim was made in that speech. The claim that trans people led the Stonewall riots. And also the claim that because when people transition, they change the nature of the sexual orientation of the relationship, that therefore trans people were going to be the people who won marriage equality for the LGB. 
1993. So that was that was the beginning of the of the effort to. It was very it's very clear in the documents from uh, the ICTLEP that they understood very very clearly that their social acceptance was dependent on attaching themselves to the gay rights movement and convincing everybody that it was the same thing. And as we know, it's not the same thing. And there are many reasons why it's not the same thing, but the fundamental reason is that the thing that upsets me the most, I think, is this whole claim, the, the claim that Stonewall uses, the whole kind of like freedom to be yourself or the claims about authenticity that were used very powerfully and correctly by the gay rights movement have been lifted wholesale and then applied to this situation. <laughs> and it's not the same. Because gay people never demanded recognition as anything other than gay people. They never demanded recognition as another class of people. No civil rights movement in history has ever demanded legal recognition as other classes of people who already exist. <laughs> and if you're going to do that, you really need to ask the people that you're trying to enter the class of whether they're okay with it. And if they say no, then maybe you should listen to them and not just demonize them as bigots and Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've got, one more, I've got one more thing I want, I want to say. And the other thing I want to say about, about this in relation to this redefinition, this is the same issue for both women and LGB people. We are being forcibly redefined against our will and against our interests in a way that prevents us from rec being recognized politically as who we are and being able to articulate our own political interests because our interests are not the same. If you colonize my class, then I can't express my own political interests because you're just subsuming my interests under yours. And they're doing the same thing to women and both LGP people and just saying, your interests are the same as ours. We're going to colonize your class and then we're going to tell you that therefore your interests are the same as ours. And they're not. So... <laughs> And the thing that I think is really important that in, with respect to both the colonization of the class of women and the colonization of the class of homosexuals and bisexual people, this was not unforeseen by the architects of the trans rights movement. They both knew that they were going to end up appropriating the class of women and they knew they were going to end up appropriating the class or redefining the class of homosexual people. And... I have a quote that I want you to read. This is from Martin Rothblatt, who is one of the architects, who was one of the main people who was involved in the ICTLEP, um, and who was one of the main architects of laid down the foundations of trans ideology. He was um, responsible for running the health project committee. So the ICTLEP worked by being divided into, they divided it into different sections of law and then theorized each of these different sections. Um, and Martin Rothblatt was in charge of the health project, and then they would give like plenary feedback reports on their different groups. When presenting the report from, on the health project in 1994, um, Rothblatt said, I'd like to point out, even concepts like gay and straight are going to lose much meaning when, to use Kate Bernstein's phrase, the opposite sex is neither, and the same sex is unique. When you get to this situation, what does it mean to say you're gay or straight? It means nothing at all. Homosexual and even bisexual lose all meaning because there aren't two choices and there are no opposites. If you are gonna politically redefine people, you are morally obliged to check that they are okay with it. This is not acceptable. Um, I said I was...
said I was going to be a good timekeeper, but we're overrunning because everybody's just been so fantastic and I didn't want to cut any of these amazing speeches short. We've got some extraordinary people here. I want to, can we overrun for 10 minutes for questions? Because I think it would be terrible if people didn't have a chance for questions. So could you, if you do have questions to our amazing speakers, please make yourselves known to whoever it is who's wandering around with the microphones. Yep, okay. Hi, a uh, question to everyone. Why do you think Stonewall was so easily captured? Because they'd done their job and they needed something else to do. <laughs> this is always the thing, institutions have their own survival instinct, right? Once they, once they got to equal marriage, their slate was clean, they should have, they should have wrapped themselves up. And or they should have uh, done the other thing that still needs to be done, which is campaign for LGB rights globally. Um, <laughs> I mean, everyone knows this story about Ruth Hunt and the fact that, you know, as far as we know, Ruth Hunt didn't want to do this, and then suddenly she did, and then she also got a House of Lords place, and we're like, I, there's a lot of, there is still something opaque that we can't see about the money and influence that's going on behind this, but, but people were lent on as well, I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to answer that? I think that was such a comprehensive answer. I don't know I think we need any more. But um, can I have another question, please? Um, where's the microphone? What? Oh, okay, just tell me where the microphone is, because I can't see very well. Yes, okay. Uh, hi there. Um, so I've seen parts of the Stonewall contracts issued to government bodies. And one thing I was going to ask, uh, um, Lucy and uh, Professor Robert, is that these contracts say quite specifically that they should disapply the law of freedom of information, they should disapply any act of parliament, and they should disapply the Information Commission office when any freedom of information request, any form of scrutiny is applied to them, and they should check immediately first with Stonewall and Stonewall's legal team to see what the legal position is for scrutiny of Sco Stonewall. So what I want to ask just kind of firstly is, uh, how has this got to the stage? But secondly, is it now not also slightly corrosive that we have got to a point that government lawyers who should know about the supremacy of parliament, I mean, this is first year stuff at a legal course, are now agreeing to a course of action which is placing now Stonewall above parliament, above a democratically elected body, and actually even above Supreme Court and any other form of information commission office appeal? Sorry, I know, I know you didn't ask me. But yeah, I, the argument they're using under FOI is that it's commercially sensitive, which I find bizarre because Stonewall's a charity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But that, that, that's the argument that they're trying to use, is that it's commercially sensitive information. Yeah, I mean, but they're, they're fantastically popular. I spent five years as a lobbyist. I wish I'd been nearly that good. <laughs> Somebody on that side of the room? If you have a, a microphone. Okay, come on then. <laughs> for us all to look at uh, how badly everyone else is doing and there's plenty of us to be talking about with that but I would really like to encourage some self-reflexivity in terms of the language that we use um, if if I can say we as a don't even know what we'd call ourselves but a broad you know collection of radical feminists lesbians gay men gender critical whoever because I did notice, um, in, and so I guess this question goes to all the panel, um, you know, in, in terms of the presentations, which I thought were brilliant, all of them, I noticed language such as gender identity extremists. And this is something I see a lot. And is there such a thing as a gender identity moderate? I don't think there is. And I think... <laughs> I think that by using this word extremist, which I see a lot in the blogs and the media pieces, it's trying to separate out, separate out, oh, there are these nice trans over here who just want to, they always seem to just want to go to the local shop in, you know, in the, they just live in a village and just want to go to the shop. They still want to do that with everyone pretending that they're women. 
so I think this use of the word extremist is one of these weasel words to, to be very careful of. And if we say gender identity extremist, we're, we're implying that there isn't a position where a man can pretend he's a woman, and that is not a thoroughly extreme position. So I just want to be careful. I also noticed people on the panel using terms like um, Tara Wolfe, um, Maria McLachlan was assaulted. She was not assaulted by a trans woman, any kind of woman. She was assaulted by a man. And if we call this man a trans woman, we are masking the fact that he is a man. Yes. And so anyway, sorry, that's quite a, and I saw someone, I heard someone else saying the term trans people, which is reinforcing the notion that there is such a thing as trans people. So that's my contribution. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did actually say trans woman who was a male uh, who was forced to be called a female. I think it's, it's um, unwise to try and school people on this panel on what language we should use. I certainly will use language I feel comfortable with, and I will carry on doing so. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I agree with Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are lots of things here. One is the claim that there's no distinction between people who are committed to trans ideology and people who transition. And then there is the claim that we all must subscribe to your interpretation and use the language that you think is correct. So the first thing I want to say is, I'm no more fond of coerced language from people on our side than I am from of coerced language from people on the other side. <laughs> And, 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 and you have a particular ontological position. I respect your position. I respect that that is a position that people hold. I don't think it's incoherent. I also think there are other people in this fight who do not hold the same ontological position as you. And I think the line that we need to draw is to do with the political recognition and the political erasure of sex and the impact of that on women and on homosexuals and on young children. That's what holds this coalition together. We don't all agree with each other. We don't all have the same ontological beliefs. We don't all need to go up to trans people and say, you're a man. And we don't need to police people and tell them that they are not doing it correctly if they don't do that. <laughs> right? So, 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 Julia, yes, you have said that. Okay, so what, so what are you, so what are you saying? And, and are you suggesting that those of us who don't hold the same position are not reflective? That we have not considered the ontology? Sure, it does. I agree with you. It, it does, and some of us have considered it and come to a different decision. Yeah, I think it's, this is unfortunate, isn't it? Um, we, yeah, I'm actually in favor of building bridges. I'm actually in favor of promoting dialogue. And I would like to remind everybody that LGB Alliance was founded after a very, very long period of trying to establish dialogue with Stonewall. It was that lack of dialogue that meant that we felt we, we had to start uh, LGB Alliance. Let us not make dialogue more difficult than it has to be. Does anybody, I mean, I, I think we should perhaps wrap up here unless somebody else has something really, but Rob? With regard to language, I'd just like to make two points. I haven't used the word gender in my writing for 25 years. So if you mean sex, say sex. So <laughs> when you're using phrases like gender pay gap, gender equality, etc., rethink that. The other is I see um, different uh, language being used, trans women with a space in between trans women as one word. I, I understand, uh, my own position is I think if you use trans and women together, you're making a major concession because the argument is then made, well, that's like black women, so therefore you're racist. Um, 
So um, I found a good legal precedent. It's in the new Scot uh, Act in Scotland on hate crime and hate speech. And it's a defined term, it's a term used in the Act, male to female transgender person, fe uh, female to male transgender person. And that's what I use. It's respectful and it's, it is accurate. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm very sorry if you, you had questions which weren't an answered, but perhaps you will be able to uh, ask them to, to the people that you meet. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, just before, just before you go to lunch, I want to draw your attention to a particular crowdfunding campaign that we would like you to support if you can. I'm sure some of you will have heard of Professor Joe Phoenix, who's taking, who's taking her employer to court. Jo is here today. She's actually volunteering for us. Please go speak to Joe, see what you can do to support her. Thank you.